Oh, hallelujah. Welcome back to our Bible study on Romans. And I want to say, based on our last study, as I get this ready, I want to welcome you back, you children of God, if you are born again and you remember what we studied in the last video where it said uh, in verse 15, we left off in Romans 8.15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Capital S on spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit. We've been adopted and we've received the spirit of adoption deposited in the believer, in the saint letting us know that we are God's children, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, or Father, our Father. A term of endearment, a term of intimacy, um, and that we're serious. And, uh, and we have a loving Heavenly Father. That's the difference in our Christian walk as opposed to the false religions that are out there who only do the things... Uh, the rituals and the the false rituals and the cutting of themselves and the uh, the 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 works that they do for their God to try and please their God and they have no relationship with them they no other religion looks at God as their father but the true religion Christianity where we follow Jesus and Jesus would let us to the Father he pointed us to the Father he gave us access to our Heavenly Father now that we can go through that veil that was torn at the crucifixion of Jesus the veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies the room that was only was excluded to the high priest alone uh, one day of the year on the Day of Atonement where he would go in with the blood offering and pour it out on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant now you and I have been made a kingdom of priests where we have access because of that veil being torn by Jesus Christ we have access now to go into the Holy of Holies to our Father where we have a relationship with our Father and what a blessing as a born-again believer a new creature a new man in Jesus Christ we have access to our Father and we can go in and pour out our hearts to our Father and have a relationship with him and that is following Jesus Christ. That is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And no other religion offers that. They only offer false hopes of trying to appease a false god or a demon or a devil who receives worship for himself and gives no assurance, no promise of right standing. Um, only lies. Satan only offers lies and false religions to deceive its believers, their, his believers, into uh, taking them to hell and destroying their lives. But God of the Bible is not so. We can enter in behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, into the very throne room and presence of the Lord, making our petitions known, bearing our hearts, crying out to our God, and receiving pardon and what a uh, what uh, what a wonderful thing you know as sons and daughters of the holy God of the universe we uh, can can go in and see what our Heavenly Father is doing you know I'm I'm in my mind I, I think of uh, presidents of the United States such as Abraham Lincoln for one example where he would uh, be ruling in the Oval Office in the White House and his son or one of his sons would come in or be playing in the background as all these heads of state are there while he's conducting business the son has access into the presidential quarters into the, the where the heads of state meet and where the mighty men of the earth meet and plan and here uh, the son has special access where he can go in any room of the White House any room um, he is welcome because why not because he's some great politician but because his father is the president of the United States or was the president of the United States and so is it as Christians our father is the King of Kings the Lord of hosts Yehovah mighty God and we can not call him by his first name but we can call him father and that is a a delight it's a wonderful privilege 
if you're born again, that you have access to uh, being a part of God's family. So we're now having that established, we're going to move on to verse 16. And we're going to continue on in our, our study. And we're going to follow Albert Barnes' commentary here. So we see that it says, The Spirit itself, the Holy Spirit, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So, as we've said, the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit here is intended. That's the meaning of the Spirit. And it's evident because first... This is the natural meaning of the expression, because it is of the Holy Spirit, secondly, that the Apostle is mainly treating here, meaning in his discussion on Romans uh, chapter 8, and because, third, it would be an unnatural and forced construction to say of the tempter of adoption that it bore witness. Oh, sorry, I, I misquoted that. Because it would be an unnatural and forced construction to say of the tempered of adoption because the the context is adoption and we've been speaking of adoption uh, because it would be unnatural and forced construction to save the temper of adoption that it bore witness well that's a complicated saying okay I think uh, I think I figured it out so he's not he's saying that it's it, it would be unnatural and forced to say that the adoption bore witness it's not that uh, it's the Holy Spirit that bears witness. And so let's go on in this verse. He says that the Spirit itself beareth witness. And that simply means that the Holy Spirit testifies and he gives evidence with our spirit. And simply that simply means to our minds. This pertains to the adoption. And it means that the Holy Spirit furnishes evidence to our minds that we are adopted into the family of God. This effect is not infrequently attributed to the Holy Spirit, meaning it's it's accredited to him, it's shown of him frequently in many scriptures, and I want to get into some of those. First of which being 2 Corinthians one twenty two, where it says, "Who the speaking of the Holy Spirit, who hath also also uh, speaking of God, who has also sealed us and given the earnest or deposit of the Spirit in our hearts. And that's what happens at the new birth. We're given the deposit of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So it's as though God is claiming his possession. 1 John 5.10 John is saying, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness, witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So here, if you believe on Jesus Christ, if you've trusted him as Lord, and are following him as Lord and Savior, you have this witness in yourself. So you have an inner witness. Let's just look at the next verse. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So this inner witness is the record God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And yeah, the next verse, I was just thinking of this. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Okay, so there's an inner witness in verse 10. Um, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, right? And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. So this witness is declaring that God has given you, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, has given you an inner witness that we have, get, that we have received eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Right? So he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So there's an inner witness that takes place at the new birth, declaring that you have eternal life, and this eternal life is, is uh, 
this life is in his son, meaning you are in relationship with his son. And you have you possess it. And you if you possess this relationship, he that hath the son hath life, everlasting life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. So it's a present tense obtaining of eternal life that we have eternal life if you are you and I are in right relationship with the Lord and we put our trust and believe this inner witness we have faith in our heart then we have eternal life now we have we are partaking of God's eternal life and that's what eternity when we die when we these physical bodies die we are now going to be forever in his presence but it starts here and now you know, but we'll see him face to face then. Right now, we we don't see the Spirit of God with our natural eyes. We only sense in His presence, His voice, in our in our hearts, and that is enough to know that we have this inner witness is enough to know that we have life, and that we possess it now. And then, as we step in from this life into death, we will just continue on in our relationship. Of everlasting life with him but then we'll see him face to face hallelujah what a day that is are you ready friends are you ready to cross over that if you are called upon by the Lord that your life is called upon and he he Jesus holds the keys of life and death and he allows you to die are you ready to meet him that's why we're doing these videos we're analyzing God's Word to build up faith to point you and I in the direction of a relationship that we might have the Son and if we have the Son the Son of God we have life but if you don't have the Son of God you don't have life if you don't have that inner witness you don't have life have that inner witness friends put your trust your whole trust your whole faith in Jesus Christ where we can receive eternal life now it only comes through him alright let's continue on First uh, Corinthians 2.12 Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So is he's saying now. Now we have received. Not the spirit of the world. The spirit of the world is gone. Satan is gone out of our life. That it was he was leading us into sin, he was keeping us in bondage to sin. Now we have received God's Spirit. We have, but the, we have received the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, that's what the Spirit of God brings to the table a knowing, a knowledge of the things God has for you and I that we have access to now. And how many Christians really believe that? How many Christians believe that we have access to, the, to the, the things of God now? I believe many Christians are going to grieve when they get to heaven because they didn't think they had access to the things of God now. There's going to be many uh, spiritual gifts and uh, gifts of God that are only received by faith and by an upright walk with the Holy Spirit. He gives those gifts to his people, but people won't partake of them because they never had faith to receive them here and now. And they're going to weep and they're going to mourn for the lost time that they have no more ability to do that when they make it to, to heaven. There's no more fruit that they can bear. It's too late. Their, uh, their access to those gifts, their ability to use those gifts to lead others into God's kingdom, to bear fruit for the kingdom of God, that's, uh, well, that's going to be gone. So we need to understand now, by the spirit that's been given us, given to us, and we need to know now that there are things freely given to us by God, and we need to seek Him. And God will answer those prayers if we seek Him in faith, and He wants to give good things to His children. And His gifts of the Holy Spirit are good things because if they're used in a... With, by a man of character, if they're used in the right way, as Jesus used them, he's our example, it's going to bring help to people. I mean, the gifts of the Spirit are going to help people. And we want those functioning in the body of Christ. Okay, so 
Let's go back to our textual verse here so we don't lose our place. So the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So this Spirit, it bears witness, it testifies, gives evidence with our spirit. That's what we've been talking about. So we see how the Holy Spirit bears this witness to the life of the believer. Um, if it be asked how this is done, how does the Holy Spirit bear witness? This is I'm going back to Albert here. If you ask, question may be formed in your brain, how this is done. How does the Holy Spirit bear witness with our spirit? His answer is, uh, it is not any revelation of new truth. Right? So there are many um, Christians out there who function by always receiving a new revelation of the Holy Spirit. Um, that can happen, but it's it's not, I think, the norm. Um, if you're receiving special revelation, you have to be careful. We always have to test the spirits. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, will never contradict uh, the Word of God. So if it's the Spirit of God, it's always going to be in line with the Word of God. And there are those who would would like to paint doubt on the Word of God. There are uh, many people speaking for the Holy Spirit that would, would say that the Scriptures are no longer trustworthy, which is dangerous. Um, because that kind of argumentation goes hand in hand with what Satan did to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where... Satan looks at Eve and says, hath God said, right? Satan's goal in life and still today to deceive mankind is to put us in doubt of God's word. Hath God really said this? Or um, can we, can we, you know, basically we can't trust what God has said. And the scriptures, which have been faithfully passed down from generation to generation, where they were originally handwritten scrolls on papyrus and parchment. Parchment is just animal skins. Papyrus was made from uh, papyrus reeds pressed together, which didn't last long. You know, every 100, 200 years, these scrolls, um, and a scroll was just parchments that were sewn together and, and made, turned into a roll, and they could be 20 to 40 feet long, perhaps and uh, you know contains so many books or so many letters and so they would wear out and they would have to be replicated they would have to be duplicated until the printing press so I I think it was in the around 1500 1480 something uh, you know we had the Gutenberg press Johann Gutenberg in Germany so they made this press and they began to print Bibles Bibles began to be constructed in a book form, Biblios. Um, that's what the word Bible comes from. It's a, a book form of pages where you have text on, written on the front and back of, of, of the Bible. Well, you've got, God has maintained the accuracy of his word. Even, you know, how it was distributed. It was distributed throughout the world. It was translated. We have over 24,000 manuscripts today that go back to nearly the first century. And they testify. You can reconstruct these letters, even though they've been written in different languages, been disseminated. Um, you can reconstruct them with 99% accuracy. God has maintained his word throughout the centuries. Not only is it with the New Testament, where there were 24,000 New Testament documents, I think around 6,000, almost 6,000 in Greek, 10,000 in the Latin, and then the remaining were in other languages. Uh, God has maintained the accuracy of the scriptures. The Old Testament was maintained by the Jews who faithfully, um, faithfully, I mean, they looked at every jot and tittle every X, uh, punctuation mark to make sure that it was accurately
transcribed. And if there was a mistake made, generally those those documents were thrown out. They were destroyed. So there there were people writing it. Scribes. That's what the scribes were called. We see the the scribes. Jesus is addressing the scribes in the Gospels, and um, they were. They weren't the priests like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but they, they had scribes. Scribes would actually uh, write out new scrolls, and they were very methodical and precise when they did this. And they had more than just the scribes' pair of eyes. They had people looking over their shoulder, making sure, you know, so there was accountability, I believe, is how it was set up. So God has painstakingly painstakingly looked over his word making sure that people don't meddle with it and if men meddle with it he said uh, in Revelation if we add to the words of that book um, I believe this applies to the whole Bible God will take your name out of the book of life so there is a high penalty of man to change God's word and so we have to be very careful in God's spirit um, when he speaks is always going to line up with the written word. It's always going to line up with God's word. And the written word is just God's word translated down, written down by holy men of God as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. So God's given us that to, to be, you know, that's called the canon. The canon of scripture is the letters that were recognized as being inspired by God, by the church. Um, and canon simply means a reed. A reed is a was used as a measuring rod, and that's what, or a measuring stick, and that's what God's word is to us. It's a measuring stick. We measure our lives by it, and the Holy Spirit will speak to us through His word. So, what Albert is saying here is, you know, don't expect this inner witness of of God, the Holy Spirit, with our spirit to be. Uh, a revelation of a new truth. No, there's a lot to be revealed out of what God has already spoken that we don't understand yet. And we need to have an open heart. And the Holy Spirit will reveal things. You'll see things in Scripture that you've never seen before. But it'll be in Scripture. It'll line up. So what he's saying is this bearing witness, the Spirit with our spirit, is not any, any revelation of new truth. It's not by inspiration. It's not always by assurance it's not by mere persuasion that we are elected to eternal life but it is by producing in us the appropriate effects of his influence it is his it is his to renew the heart to sanctify the soul to produce love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness and temperance and I'll show you those. Those are the gifts of the Spirit, by the way. I'm sure many of you have heard that in Galatians 5:22, the gifts of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit, gifts, the fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So there's nine of them that we just read through. And what he's saying is that the Spirit will renew our heart and will sanctify or set apart the soul to produce. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to produce in you and I. Are these? This is what he brings. And this is a true test of the spirit that you may be dealing with, is there should be a love, a joy, a peace, a long-suffering, which is another word for patience, suffering long, right? A gentleness... He's gentle. That's awesome. He doesn't barge in. He doesn't kick the door down in your life and demand you do it his way. There's a gentleness. He comes in with a still, small voice. There's a goodness. The Holy Spirit, Spirit is pure, is good, just like God. It's going to inspire faith, right? We know that faith from Hebrews, uh, Hebrews um, 11, I think. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There's a meekness, right? Jesus himself described himself in Matthew 11 as meek and lowly in heart. When we take his yoke upon us, he's meek and he's lowly in heart. And there's temperance. 
Um, temperance is just self-control. So these are the, the character traits the Holy Spirit will bring. These are the character traits he wants to form in your heart. He doesn't want you just to get some special revelation, although the, the Holy Spirit can bring revelation into what God is thinking. I don't want to say he can't. All right, but many people just seek that. And they ignore they ignore the character traits God wants to bring. He's trying to transform you and I into the image of Jesus. We're to be like him. And these are the character traits he wants to instill in you and I. So let's let's continue on. If a man has these, he has evidence the witnessing of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, with his Spirit. If not, he has no such evidence. And the way, therefore, to ascertain whether we have this witnessing of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is by an honest and prayerful inquiry whether these fruits of the Spirit actually exist in our hearts and minds. If they do, then the evidence is clear. If not... All vain confidence of good estate, all visions and raptures and fancied revelations will be mere delusions. So what he's saying is if you don't have these character traits, if you don't see these evident in your mind and heart, but you're, you know, you, you on the other hand are receiving all these visions and raptures and fancied revelations that people with itching ears want to hear, um, He's saying, "Don't. It's a false estate. It's no. It's a. You know. It's. It's uh, not what you should be trusting in. And these all. All these revelations will be mere delusions. They're going to lead you astray. You may be following following another spirit. That's why we have to be careful. We have to. That's why God gave us the Word of God. We can ascertain." what the Spirit of God is like and what he's going to say to us and we then can discern if a let's say Satan were to come and whisper in your ear pretending to be the Spirit of God right then you know what is it Paul said test all spirits we you know it's Satan himself can come as an angel of light and or a minister of the gospel, a minister of the word of God. Satan can dress up like a Christian. And he, you know, even Jesus said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. So they're, they're a wolf underneath a sheep's outfit. You know, you've seen the cartoon, like, uh, Wile E. Coyote in Bugs Bunny. And you've got the sheepdog who is guarding the sheep. And one of the tactics of Wile E. Coyote is he puts on a sheep's outfit and he tries to um, mingle among the herd of sheep so that he can snatch one and eat it and devour it. And the sheepdog was not ignorant to his devices and would always uh, smell him out. He could smell the, the wolf that he was. And... Uh, Anyway, Jesus warns us, being the good shepherd, he warns us of, of this. And so um, our, our goal as Christians is to hear the Spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit. And, and we can hear it, and we just need to know what kind of spirit he is. He's holy, and he brings these fruits with him. And, uh, and we can find him if we go with an honest and prayerful inquiry. Um, do these fruits exist in our hearts and in our minds? All right. So it, let me add one more thing here, according to Albert, that the effect of these fruits of the spirit and the mind is to, on the mind is to produce a calm and heavenly frame. And in that frame, when attended with the appropriate fruits of the spirit, in a holy life, we may rejoice as an evidence of piety. Well, that's a, quite a way to say it. So these fruits are going to produce a peace in your mind. Um, and you're going to be heavenly minded if these fruits are evident. They're going to be fruits that I believe every soul in God's presence who has died in heaven, we would say, 
that's what they're possessing right now. And that's what you and I are to possess on this earth, to have this love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control here and now. Um, and so let's go back to our textual verse here. So, so he bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So again, we are adopted into his family. Hallelujah. All right, so now we go to the next verse in verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So he says, and if children. So if we're adopted into his family, then heirs. And that simply means that is he will treat us as sons or daughters, whatever the gender may be. An heir is one who succeeds to an estate. The meaning here is that if we sustain the relation of sons of God, that we shall be treated as such and admitted to share his favors. An adopted son comes in for part of the inheritance. All right, and he references uh, Numbers 27, and we'll get into this just a little bit. This is uh, the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Mas Masher, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and these are the names of his daughters. Mala, Noah, and Hagla, and Milka, and Terza, and they stood before Moses, and before Eli Eliezer, the priest, and before the princes, and the congregation, by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin, and had, and had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family, because he hath no son? Give us... Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses brought this case before the Lord, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, um, I'll just read the, the second part of verse 7. And the Lord basically said, Thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. All right, so these, these daughters came in, and the father of... Uh, Zelophehad had no um, had no son. So in Israel, the the sons, the oldest son, was to inherit his father's estate when the father passed. And so here there was no son. So they were taking land possessions in the uh, in the land of Canaan. You know they were conquering the enemies, and uh, you know they were beginning to. Um, there was land to be given out and I think Joshua took them fully over the Jordan into the promised land after Moses had died so there was some land taken on the uh, this would have been on the east side of Jordan I believe and uh, then they moved across the Jordan and started taking the land um, between the Jordan and Mediterranean <coughs> after Moses had died so these daughters came in that said, you know, basically said, why should our father, because he had no son, why should our family have no uh, inheritance? So the Lord said, yes, it's not just about the sons, it's also about the daughters. And they, um, and you and I in the new covenant, we, uh, we come in and we are treated as sons, we're adopted as his children, and then we're heirs. We're heirs to the promises uh, all the promises that God has for his children. So, uh, let's go back here. So, he says that they're heirs of God. And of children than heirs, heirs of God. And this expression means that we shall be partakers of that inheritance which God confers on his people. That inheritance is his favor here. And eternal life hereafter. So we have favor in the here and now on earth as being his son and if you've been born again and you you've seen perhaps the favor of the Lord in your life right and if you haven't you need to question why 
Are you in alignment with him? Are you hearing this? Are you walking after the spirit? And if not, perhaps you're walking after the flesh and the Lord is chastening you. You have to be, again, you have to look and listen for the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the Holy Spirit now is going to treat you and I. Discipline is treating us as sons. You know, even in a natural family, a son or daughter that that um, is out of alignment with the family, with the father, uh, needs a spanking once in a while on the on the seat of learning. And the Lord will do that in the in the believer's life when he's out of alignment. So, again, another mark of being a son or a daughter is is the Lord correcting you. Um, so. Are you receiving favor here and now? And because that's it, that's one telltale sign. And then eternal life hereafter, right? And that's what we're all endeavoring for, that we have the Son. He who has the Son has life. So this is an honor infinitely higher than to be heir to the most princely earthly inheritance or than to be or than to be the adopted son of the most magnificent earthly monarch. So what he's saying is if you are um, the son of some rich billionaire, you know, you think of the, the richest person on earth right now, and, you know, Bill Gates or, or uh, Warren Buffett, you know, these, these billionaires, it's better, um, it's better to be an heir of God than to receive all the wealth that some billionaire might have in this earth right now. You know, many people would think it's better to receive it here and now. But these are all goods and things that are going to be left behind. You know, anyone who is rich and wealthy here and now, well, those things don't go with him. They, you know, they, you know, they have more money than they could spend in multiple lifetimes or more houses than they can actually live in or more cars than they can actually drive you know it's funny to see pe these millionaires or billionaires who own multiple cars and they just sit in garages because how often can it one person drive them you know and how many houses can one person live in you can't be everywhere at the same time so your greatest possession is to be an heir of god because not only do you receive favor in this life, but you receive everlasting life. And you will enter into God's eternal life, his, his eternal kingdom. So when it says, in joint heirs with Christ. So Christ is by eminence the Son of God. As such, he is heir to the full honors and glory of heaven. Christians are united to him. They are his friends. And they are thus represented as destined to partake with him of his glory. They are the sons of God in a different sense from what he is. He by his nature and high relation, they by adoption. But still the idea of sonship exists in both, and hence both will partake in the glories of the eternal inheritance. So let's look at the... Uh, Philippians 2, 8 through 9 and Hebrews 2, 9 through 10 to see uh, the sonship that's, that Jesus Christ has. So this is speaking of Jesus in Philippians 2, 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Wherefore God hath also also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name right so jesus is highly exalted and he is the son of god and then we see in hebrews 2 9 talks of jesus the son of god but we see jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he might he that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, speaking of the atonement. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, right? So by he created everything basically, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, 
to make the captive of their salvation perfect through sufferings. All right, so Jesus is the captive of our salvation, and he brings, and God the Father is bringing many sons unto glory, and Jesus is the captain, and he was made perfect. He was perfected, made complete, after becoming a man and then suffering for you and I. So that's the glory of Jesus, that we are the many sons. You know, we're the many sons if you believed on Jesus' atonement. And Jesus is the captain, the captain of our salvation. So there's a rank there, isn't there? <laughs> Jesus is in a much higher position than you and I. So the connection between Christ and Christians is often referred to in the New Testament. The fact that they are united here is often alleged as a reason why they will be in glory. John 14, 19. So let's look at that verse. Jesus speaking to his disciples before he goes to the cross. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And we see in... 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, that it's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, Jesus, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So, and then finally in Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh, Jesus speaking, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and, have set, and am set down with my Father in his throne. And then finally, John 17, 22 through 24. Let's see here. All right, so, and the glory which thou gavest me, Jesus speaking again, the night before crucifixion, which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, and thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Yes, Jesus, the Son of God, are with the Father from the foundation of the world and before. So, we are joint heirs with Christ. That's what this verse is about. Joint heirs with Christ. Let me find it again. So you can see now we are we are made joint heirs with Christ. Jesus is bringing us along. We're like the younger brothers, and he's bring he's their faithful older brother, if that's a way we can say it. I don't want to say anything that's um, not honoring, but he's bringing you and I as faithful siblings with him, and he's the captain of our salvation, and he's made a way where we can access the Father and be with him. That was Jesus' prayer the night before the crucifixion, that we would be with the Father and him, and that we would be unified together. So, hallelujah, we are joint heirs with uh, Jesus Christ. And it says that we're joint heirs, if so be, which means if this condition exists, we shall not be treated as co-heirs with him unless we have, unless we here give evidence that we are united to him. All right, so we have to be united with Jesus to be co-heirs with him. And that means that we suffer with him in this verse. In Greek, it means if we suffer together, that we may also be glorified together. If we suffer in his cause, 
or bear afflictions as he did, or are persecuted and tried for the same thing, and thus show that we are united to him. So do you want to be a follower of Jesus? Do you want to be a co-heir with Christ? Then we have to suffer with him. Did you know that about your Christian walk? That uh, Jesus didn't paint a walk through the garden for the Christians. That if they hated him, that they were going to hate us also. Because we're trying to be like him. And Jesus was a representation of the Father. And that's what you and I are trying to, to be. And uh, they will hate us because we speak the truth about it, that its deeds are evil. Just like just the world will hate us because we speak that its deeds are evil. Just like Jesus told his brothers that, you know, I can't go up to the feast now. You can go anytime you want, but the world, it hates me. <laughs> Because I testify that its deeds, I testify to the truth that its deeds are evil. And that's what the truth does. Uh, uh, you know, sticking to God's truth, declaring God's truth, um, it's at enmity with the way people live their lives on this earth in their sin. And it's going to testify against them, and they're going to hate you and I for it. But you and I, we have to be willing to suffer with him, to be co-heirs with him. And when we suffer with him, we're going to be glorified together. So if we suffer in his cause, bear afflictions as he did, are persecuted and tried for the same thing, and thus show that we are united to him, it does not mean that we suffer to the same extent that he did. You and I may never be crucified on a cross, but we may imitate him in the kind of our sufferings and in the spirit with which they are born, and thus show that we are united to him. So we may never go through the same level that Jesus went through. Um, but they're going to be the same kind of sufferings. And, um, but, you know, they could be to martyrdom. The, the initial 12 disciples, or the 11, you know, Judas excluded, they were all martyred. John was attempted to be martyred. He uh, was boiled in oil, tradition has it. Uh, by the Roman Emperor, but he lived, and then he was sentenced to the Isle of Patmos, a prison island. And uh, when he was set free, he, I think, it, what I understand is he ended up back in the uh, in the church in Ephesus, but he died in his 90s. I don't know that for sure, but that's what I've I've um, I, I've read at one point in my Christian experience. So. If you know something more, then by all means, you know, contact me or comment in the, in the video, and, and we can correct that. All right, and it says here in the end of this verse that we may be also glorified together. So, if we're united in the same kind of sufferings as the Lord, there is propriety in being united in destiny beyond the scenes of all suffering, the kingdom of blessedness and love. So. If we're united here and now in the sufferings, the same kind of sufferings that Jesus had, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. He's still alive. He still suffers, uh, I believe. He's grieved when he sees the sin in this world. Um, but if we're suffering with him, declaring his kingdom and receiving persecution, uh, we can also know that the kingdom of blessedness and love, his kingdom, we stand to inherit it, inherit it, and that is one of the hopes that's laid before you and I, that we can partake with Jesus in his kingdom, being a co-heir uh, with him. And you know what the co-heirs do. The co-heirs are not worthy to receive anything from the Lord. They all, all the ones that have received crowns, they cast them down at his feet <laughs> in the vision of heaven. Um, because we're only there, any one of us, because of him, because of his spirit that's poured out in our life. That's the only reason, and he's so worthy. May you find him today, friend. We're going to end this video here, and that let's press on. Let's press on in our walk with Jesus Christ. He is worthy. And his spirit is here to help you and I to make it.
in that we will be glorified with him one day if we stay the course and run the race to the end. May God bless you, and we'll see you in the next video.